No. Shh. You're going to have to go outside. Come on. Welcome, everyone. I'm so happy that you could join us. Particularly happy to see at least one or more priests here. So I hope we'll provide some practical guidance uh, and also some guidance you can take back to your pastor or your music director, or if you are the music director. Um, the topic tonight is Eucharistic Renaissance, but this is our, we have actually two incredible, three incredible panelists. Uh, Father Michael Renier, mm -hmm. he says that's the way you say it in Missouri, um, who has, uh, is a parish priest and has written a uh, uh, really beautiful book, which I sent around a link to the review of, uh, The Forgotten Liturgy, about the poetics, and also about his experiences helping to build a successful parish through more beautiful and reverent liturgy. I may paraphrase a wonderful book in a couple of sentences. My good friend and dear colleague, Dr. Jennifer Donaldson Nowitzka. How am I doing on that? It's it's good. It's it's pretty close. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, Jenny is Dr. I have to say Nowitzka again, so I'm going to call you Jenny. Is the <laughs> professor of sacred music at St. Patrick's Seminary in Menlo Park and the director of an amazing institute for Catholic sacred music. I was just with her at the Institute in at St. Patrick's Seminary this summer, which was holding three overlapping institutes, one for singers, a choral institute, one for organists, and one for composers, working with our composer in residence, Frank LaRocca. So that was quite the experience and just a taste of all that Jenny is bringing, not only to the Bay Area, but really nationally and internationally with her work. And then I'm so pleased. I Our mission is more beautiful and reverent liturgy and energizing a Catholic culture of the arts. So I'm always pleased when we have a chance to meet and get to know the work and the person of a living Catholic artist, especially one uh, as fine a painter as Nielsen Carlin. On July 26, Father Jacques Hamel uh, met the Lord on the altar in Normandy, in his church in Normandy, by two Muslim terrorists. Um, one of the beautiful details I learned is that afterwards, the he had been friends in interfaith dialogue with a, an important imam, and the local Muslim community decided to attend mass on the following Sunday on mass in honor of Father Jacques and to demonstrate solidarity with the Catholics, us Catholics in our loss. Um, and I know I saw because Ignatius Press has done a really amazing little book, big book in little package called the Catholic Home Gallery, which features 18 paintings that you can not only look at them, but you, they're in design for you to remove and frame and use in your um, private devotions or to decorate your home. Uh, and one of them was this just stunning portrait of Father Jacques Hamel. So I was so pleased when it did, are you still there? Did we lose you? I'm here, uh, talking about me? Okay, good, good. Yeah. There you are in the artist studio. <laughs> so maybe um, so we're going to say a few. We're going to start in honor of the martyrdom. Um, this is our year for Eucharistic saints and martyrs. So we're going to talk a little bit about Father Hamill and look at this beautiful painting. Nielsen Carlin has been a working painter for 30 years, both commercial and fine art. He now concentrates mostly on sacred art. 
He has work commissioned in the uh, Shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe in the Cathedral of the Immaculate Conception in Kansas City <laughs> and in many other places. But, and he was also commissioned when the Pope came to Philadelphia in 2015. Uh, can everyone please mute who's not a panelist? Um, Okay, I'm gonna have to find those people and mute them. Let's see, mute you. Okay, there you go. Sorry, I know I like to let people come in live and sometimes it messes things up a little. Anyway, yeah. uh, he commissioned, oh, yeah, a, he painted an icon, a special icon of the Holy Family. Um, for, um, all right. Where are we going? Oh, yeah, I think, Maggie. Okay, guys, I'm going to mute everyone and then we'll have to unmute the pan panelists. Please unmute yourself. Um, and I am not muted. So, okay, good. Thank you. Uh, an icon of the Holy Family for the World Day of the Families in 2015. So, Nielsen, welcome. Thank you. Um, Tell us a little bit about the paintings behind you while I get the image of Father Jacques Hamel up. Sure. Uh, well, I, as you said, um, from a, a career standpoint, it's actually not that I work mostly for churches these days. Since 2007, when I did my first Sacred Art Commission for the Shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe, I realized over the, a very grueling 13 months getting paintings done for that shrine, that painting for the church was my vocation. So that's exclusively what I've done since 2007 is work for new and renovated churches uh, doing, you know, whatever, basically whatever types of original art that they need for their parish. Um, so, but between commissions, uh, when I can steal some time, um, I do paintings for my own purposes. I mean, they are for sale, but it's more or less saints that, that I have a particular, uh, found out about, have a particular interest in. And in my own time, uh, I will do paintings for my own purposes so that I can commit their, their likeness to, to paint, uh, basically to use my skills to, in some cases, bring awareness to saints that aren't known. In other cases, just saints that I found out about because I was not raised Catholic. I came into the church at uh, 30, at, at the age of 30. Um, saints that I found out about, like, Maximilian Colby, uh, that um, just the story completely bowled me over. So the pieces behind me are just some of the things sitting in the studio. Uh, the piece, in fact, when I, my uh, confirmation uh, uh, name is um, uh, Thomas Aquinas. At that time, it, when I was 30, I'd never heard of Maximilian Colby. And I have nothing against St. Thomas Aquinas, but I've, if I found out about it, uh, uh, Colby, Maximilian Colby, I would have taken him as my confirmation saint. So when I found out about his story, again, usually what happens is I'll find out a particular story intrigues me. And when I have the time, I will get to work on it. So I have St. Maximilian on one side, on the other side. And again, I don't know, you know, the, anyone that's on the call. It's Father Trong Bu Dip. If I'm butchering the name, I apologize. He was a Vietnamese priest that was executed in I get a head like a sieve because I have three teenagers. I believe it was 1945. Um, and then um, you could see, I think on the floor next to me is uh, Bishop Fulton Sheen, who was instrumental when I was going through the, the pr slow process coming from evangelical Christianity into full communion with the Catholic church. Bishop Sheen watching the old episodes of his show played a big part in my conversion from uh, you know an intellectual standpoint. Um, so, on my own time, as I said, I will pick saints. I think there's also uh, uh, Saint uh, Teresa Benedict of the Cross, Edith Stein back there. So when I heard the story, I don't know. I, I mean, when the story broke about Father Hamill, I, again, it just put the hook in me. I, I have a great love of martyrs. Uh, I mean, again, growing up in the evangelical church, there was always those conversations that if you were put on the spot and a gun was to your head to confess Jesus Christ as your Lord or not, that was a question that was always out there when I was growing up and it was always in my head. So I think I have a great love of the martyrs because they've answered that question. And to this day, I don't know if, I don't know what I would do. I'd like to say, oh, of course I would do what Father Hamill said, but I don't think anyone may, I'll say, speak for me. I hope I will. Have was, it, was, it, was it Flannery? Was it Flannery O'Connor who said, I had a character say, I think I could be a martyr 
she thought she could be a martyr if they killed her real quick. That's <laughs> yeah. Kind of like where I am, I think. But God give us grace. Yeah. So so when I heard the story, uh, you know, when I'm doing commission work for parishes, of course, that usually the parish priest or the council comes and they have a saint or a New Testament depiction in mind. And it's basically my job to flesh it out, right? Add my flair to it within the boundaries of Catholic iconography. Um, yeah. But when it comes to the paintings that I do on my own, it either will go through a process of kind of sketch revisions where I'll write down the things that I know about the saint and do a thumbnail process where I'm doing a lot of little very quick sketches on napkins and other things when I'm having my morning coffee and kind of build the image from there. But every once in a while, like in the case with Father Hamill, when I heard the story, the image really popped in my head immediately. It took me about a year to make the painting because I was stealing time from other projects and I had to get the materials together, get the model, uh, you know, a model. Well, let, let's place let, let, let's stop, stop a minute because we're looking at the image now. It's incredible. Do you want to walk us through? It came to you in a flash. Do you have, can you talk to us about what we're seeing? Well, the, the imagery, so we have the, the five red roses of the five wounds of Christ, uh, to, to hopefully tying him to the, the honest man that was, that was killed, uh, you know, martyred for his honesty, right, for his, for his faith. The three theological virtues of faith, hope, and charity, of course, the palm fronds are typical symbols of, of uh, the martyr. And, you know, the K-bar knife, again, the brutality of it, and yet his response to it, his serene calm and really seeing through the attackers to who was behind it right go satan um but the the i wanted to try to capture the the strength and courage grace that he faced a really horrifying and a, you know truly horrifying martyrdom um, and I knew he was saying mass, so I thought, you know, to have him at that moment where he has the host in his hands, I thought it would make the image that much more powerful. So that was yeah, the Pope, idea. Pope Francis, a few years back, commented that he died on the altar next to the sacrifice of Christ, which is a, a beautiful way of thinking about it. Yeah. Um, Jenny, you're following along. Do you have anything to... any? Anything you want to either ask or comment or say about this image or this man? Yeah, I, I think the serenity of his face is is really arresting, Nielsen. It, it's a it's a really striking image, and um, you know, I a, a personal story from my perspective. Um, uh, in twenty seventeen, I was uh, teaching at St. Joseph Seminary in New York, and um, almost a year to the date after Father Hamel was killed, so he was killed on. Uh, the Feast of St. Anne, um, July 26th and 2016. And we were there on July 28th of 2017. I took all the seminarians from the Scola Cantorum of, of St. Joseph Seminary to um, Rouen because I wanted to go see uh, Father Hamel's church where he was killed. And it was one of the most moving experiences um, I've ever had because we were able to sing a mass there. Mm -hmm. We sang everything in Gregorian chant. Um, and there were with us two newly ordained priests who can celebrated, and they um, were able to use the vestments from the sacristy um, that, uh, I, I mean, to be a little frank, they, they, they were not the cleanest smelling vestments. Um, so they probably, um, you know, had been used by all the priests visiting there, including Father Hamel, you know, that, that they were not freshly laundered. And um, for them to be able to put on the same vestments as a visiting priest that he would have worn and you could tell that the rug um at the at, on one side of the altar was was brand new because um the, it had previously been so stained with his blood um and the the i i still remember the sound in that church it was just a simple parish church made out of stone and the the, the sound was so powerful in there i i mean it was just truly um a, an amazing experience to be able to um, see where he had died. And while we were um, celebrating that mass, actually, um, various pilgrims were coming in to visit the church. Um, I had no idea that the mass was going on. And, and there was one woman um, from North Africa, actually, that had made a, a pilgrimage to um, St. Etienne de Rouvray, where he was, 
um, just to visit where he had died and met, happened to come there while we were saying that mass and she stayed for mass and, and was so moved by everything there. I mean, it was just a really, uh, he, he was an amazing uh, witness. The, yeah, the agree, church but... is very simple, but it's also very old. It's a, is it 12th century or 14th century? It's I'm not really amazing. sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Father Michael, do you want to, do you have anything to add to this conversation? Oh, I, I don't have a whole lot to, to add. I, I think a, lo a lot of priests, though, if you were to ask them, they would probably say something along the lines of, I, I hope I die at the altar right? Uh, God willing, a long time from now, from natural causes. Uh, but when you're confronted, right, with that, with those events, right, uh, the way that he died at the altar, uh, that really makes it startling. Like, this is what I'm asking God for. Uh, yeah. Not only uh, in my future, that's my prayer for my natural death, but, but almost... Uh, every single time that I'm stepping up to the altar, uh, I'm carrying my death with me. Uh, and and that, that really gives me pause a lot of times uh, when I'm going up those steps to, to be reminded so forcefully that this is what I'm going up to do is to join my life with that of Christ. And this is the sacrifice. This is, this is a spiritual death that I am asking God, begging God to let me participate in. And I wonder if sometimes we don't sort of uh, feel the, the weightiness of that, of that prayer. Um, but a, a really beautiful, I think, work of art like this really brings it forth. Well, I'd like to remind everyone that if you would like a printed copy, you can get one from Ignatius Press. It's called the Catholic Home Gallery. It came out in January of this year. Uh, and it's got if you also a wonderful introduction to the work of uh, many other artists, including uh, Bernadette Carstensen, whom many of you will recall because she painted our painting of the patron saints of the homeless, which did feature uh, Maximil Father Maximilian Kolbe because he's the patron saint of drug addicts in the strange way the church does things because he was killed by an injection of carbolic acid. Um, and also St. Unipro Sarah and the American Saints. So, and I met some painters I hadn't been aware of, so I recommend that. Nielsen, maybe you could put in the chat box how people could get in touch with you if they are looking to commission art. Sure. I think it's Nielsen, Nielsen Carlson, but it, it put, you put it in the chat room, people will, will know how to spell it. Um, and you're welcome to join us for the whole event, or if you need to be moving on, we're going to go to our five ways to Eucharistic Renaissance. Um, we're going to start with Father Michael Renier, who has written a really amazing book. I hope you got the link to the review by Father Dwight Longenecker, a fellow uh, former Anglican. Am I, am I right about that, Father Michael? That's right. Yeah, so thank you, Pope Benedict, for bringing these fine priests, both of them. Um, and uh, you wrote a book called The Forgotten Liturgy. The, the, forgotten, lang the, forgotten, the lang forgotten Language. The Forgotten Language. Sorry, The Forgotten Language. Yeah. And but it's on liturgy. Yeah, the poetics yeah, of the... So start, but maybe you could start by telling us what prompted you to write this book and, and what did you want readers to get from it? So what really prompted it was the, the, the interior conversion in my own life and wanting to share that with people. And as a priest, having applied some of the principles uh, that I, I talk about in the book and seeing how that affected my parish and how we were seeing people drawn into interior conversion through the beauty of the mass, I, I wanted to, to share that experience more widely with people. Um, often we, we, even people who value beauty or like beauty, consider it something that's extra. It's nice if we can have it. But my contention is that it's absolutely necessary to the spiritual life. Uh, and it's, it's like an open door into heaven. It's, it's like it brings us right up to the threshold. Uh, and it's, it's, um, it's something that has a, 
a creative value. And that's what that's what I mean uh, when I'm when I'm getting at when I use that word poetics. It's this idea of well, what does it mean to be made and to to make? And often artists will use that in terms of well, what does it mean to make art? To to be someone that tries to make something beautiful or challenging for the world, and the, the source of all of that is in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. All of creation finds its source in the, the, the heart of the Mass, which is uh, Christ himself. Um, and so beauty as it is, it, it's not simply something extra that we, we do to show that um, uh, we, we have a certain uh, taste or we like this or we like that, or it makes me feel a certain way, but it's uh, beauty is integral to the mass because it, it gets to the truth of who Christ is. And once you, you understand that, you begin to see how he's remaking you through the liturgy. And one of the things in my own life that, that I've seen uh, writ large is how God has really brought me so far. I have a long way to go. But And I talk about that in my book, how if you would have been 20 years ago as a, as a Protestant, uh, really struggling with well, how do I know God is it is it the intellect is it by knowing the scriptures better than everyone else do I do I need to just learn Greek the best and read the original translations do I need to find the right denomination and I was very arrogant and simultaneously very depressed and it wasn't going well and then I encountered a, a mass out of almost out of desperation I went to a Catholic church and simply watched watched a mass and I was stunned by what I saw because this is a particularly beautiful mass that I went to. It's it's a place called the Institute of uh, the Institute of Christ the King, Sovereign Priest was running this parish in St. Louis here at, at the Oratory of St. Francis de Sales, and they put a lot of their resources into making sure the mass is beautiful, and that experience really lingered with me. And I think from that moment I was almost doomed, if you if you will, to to become Catholic. It, it took a little bit longer, um, but really the 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 hook was set uh, at that moment, and it was purely through through beauty. Well, I, I am struck by what you say, and um, the Archbishop, of course, believes a truth, goodness, and beauty are the three transcendentals, the great doorways to God. And I don't know that he thinks beauty is more important than truth or goodness, but it is the pathway to God we have dropped, sort of dropped off a cliff in the Catholic Church in the ordinary parish life. Obviously, you went to a traditional Latin mass because it instituted Christ the King. I don't know if you went looking for that or if you just stumbled through and found this magnificent uh, beauty there. And I'm so glad God led you to us and that you're now serving us as a priest. Um, what a gift to us, <coughs> all from beauty, as you say. And, um, but I, I do think sometimes, um, and maybe it was the effort to compete with Protestants on their own grounds who are, you know, be better at preaching the word on average, uh, the parts of the word they have. Um, but the, it, I, I find it frustrating that cl cognitive clarity seems to be the emphasis, not that it's a bad thing, but the point of the liturgy is enter, to enter into a mystery beyond words, which is one of the things that uh, the poetry of the mass can contribute to. Um, I don't know, Jenny, what do you think? Do you think, do you think that there's, it's worth thinking of the forgotten language of poetry and beauty as um, a key uh, path forward? Well, I can uh, heartily affirm that I have seen the fruits of it in Father Michael's own life, um, that, uh, you know, his writing is so wonderful and um, it, the, the shaping of his own heart and his own soul in the beauty of poetry uh, come through in his sensibility with how, with how he talks about the mass. And, you know, as, as a musician, I, I can also attest to the fact that um, he frequently employs some very fine musicians <laughs> to um, help accomplish this, this uh, task with him. And it's, it's beautiful that he 
um, sees the value of, of all these arts coming together. And, you know, um, I, I think maybe so many times we think so often about uh, music um, and the, the beauty of the music that we, we sometimes lose, um, you know, uh, the beauty of the poetry itself just as text. And, and that's one of the things that, you know, I think the sensitivity that Father Renier brings not only to his ministry, but also it's a, it's a seed from which um, uh, a heart for sensitivity to the world as it is and the splendor of truth and beauty um, bear fruit in his ministry. So in the forgotten language, you talk about growing a parish. Do you want to share what, what you helped to make happen with the grace of God and how you sure, did Sure, sure. And, and a lot of it is, uh, as Jenny alluded to, it's, it's down to very talented people uh, who are willing to help me out. Uh, some, some fantastic musicians, altar servers, uh, very dedicated people. Uh, so... Uh, I'm the pastor of a parish uh, called Epiphany of Our Lord in St. Louis, and I've been there about six years. Uh, alas, I'm, uh, I'm about to be transferred in a, in a couple of weeks here, which is tough for a melancholic like me, but it's, it's been a wonderful six years I've been with them. And we really transformed the parish by trying to make our liturgies excellent. Uh, not pretentious or showy, but devout, and, and beautiful in that very noble, and simple way that the Roman rite is capable of. Uh, and we did that in the ordinary form, and we, we did that through the extraordinary form. So we, we've been open to both. We've been uh, very happy to pray in all of the ways that the church was allowing us to pray. And we saw amazing results from that. Uh, so I the parish I went minute? to, so, sure. Just talk a minute and tell me, but so when how long you for six years so six years ago when you got started uh what was the parish like and what right. was the first thing that happened that started the upward change right so the the parish is a typical catholic parish uh, i don't think the parishioners had done anything wrong or were destroying the parish actively or anything like that um but what had happened is they had a they had had a parish school that had closed and when that happens the uh, parishes really struggle with decline. And so when I arrived, their school had closed about three, four years prior. There were very few children left in the parish because all the families tend to leave and go where they can find school. That's very important in St. Louis, these, these parish schools. So we had an aging congregation. Uh, it wasn't very diverse demographically. Uh, and they were struggling to find any kind of growth or, or positive direction for the parish. So what we did was really simple. We started um, within the confines of the ordinary form of the mass, uh, just trying to improve it little pieces at a time. Uh, so for our main mass on Sunday, we started using incense. We switched the altar uh, servers to altar boys wearing cassock and surplus. We slowly introduced uh, just English chant. So we didn't go really heavy on Latin. We still haven't gone really heavy on Latin, uh, but we did switch some of the ordinary parts of the mass to, to Latin. And, and then we spent a lot of time teaching the children that we had how to participate, how to chant in the Latin. We started a, a chant camp every summer where the kids come. We just finished ours this summer. We had 75 kids. They learned to chant. How many were one. in the first one you did? The first one was probably about 40, if I, if I remember correctly. Uh, and That's we started a attracting, good turnout. it's a great turnout. Yeah. And what happens is the kids realize they can chant these mass settings and then they do it. And then the parents love it one because their kids are doing it, but also because they're hearing for the first time, how beautiful these, these chant settings are. So all of a sudden everyone's on board and everyone wants to do this stuff. And, and it, it was so, really, so, okay, uh, let me pause and say, one of your recommendations, I don't want to put any words in your mouth, but I've heard this before, is have a children's chant camp and start a children's, invite the children to participate in the mass, uh, in chanting the mass. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think having the children participate at, at the level of their dignity, right? So don't give them kiddie stuff and tell them clap their hands and this is what kids do. But teach them to, to sing the mass and love it, which they can do. But then also these other things that people dismiss as 
too traditionalist or, or uh, old fashioned actually aren't at all because what they do is they appeal to the imaginations of children. So children smell the incense and they know that's what church smells like. They hear the bells ringing. They get to go at our church, we let them ring the bell tower at the at the consecration and the kids love to go out and ring the bell tower so they're all participating in their own way but in a way that's dignified to the church this is a point that archbishop corleone made to me several times he said you know we put ch children in children's choirs and they sing kitty music and then by the time they're seven they're like no that's for little kids or eight at least or nine at the latest they're like churches for little kids, the choirs for little kids. I want to do something more grown up, more teen teenager, middle school y. And uh, whereas if you teach them to sing Gregorian chant, they're doing something that is an adult activity. But Gregorian chant is a language, so children learn it faster than adults as they learn most languages. Yeah, they're, you they're say great. That's your experience too. Yeah. Yeah, they're they're great at it. And we have a similar experience with the altar boys. So when we really started challenging them and giving them real dignified work to do at the altar, I went from having, I think I had four altar servers total over the whole weekend, six years ago. Uh, today, I think I have about 35. Uh, and I've wow. never really tried to recruit them. And, and they all come for every mass because, because they all want to do it all the time. You must be, oh, it's, it's six years might not be enough time to generate vocations. But one of the things that we know is that all male altar boys uh, uh, is really important to vocations. And, I think um, so. You know, we, we've sent a couple, we've sent a couple people to seminaries already. Wow, that's yeah. wonderful. So, so you, you uh, got, got the, got an all boy altar service in cassocks, brought back incense. Did you go at Orientum right away? Uh, I, I think I waited a little bit on that because I wanted everyone to understand it. Uh, and then I started as always with the kids. So when the kids came for their catechism classes, we would often say mass with them. And I simply explained to them when I'm gonna talk to you, I look at you. And when we, we're gonna talk to God the Father, we're all gonna look at God the Father. And the kids kind of said, okay, you know, that sounds great. So, so they were all, you know, sold on it very quickly. Uh, and then we did end up adding a, a Sunday, a brand new Sunday mass to our schedule. I didn't want to disrupt the existing ones. Uh, and we mm -hmm. added it with the intention that we were going to choose for all of the most beautiful options that the church would allow. Uh, and that worked out very well. So our, our attendance, uh, it, it doubled over the last three years since we really went full steam on, on uh, making the mass so beautiful. How, how did you build, so you built a scola with the children. Is there anything else, other advice you can give? This is something Jenny knows a lot about, but what, what was your experience and how you build a beautiful, because everyone's complaining that the, it's hard to find people who know how to sing. There's no money for it. Um, what, what yeah, so that's, the, that's the issue. Face? That's the issue. No one knows how to sing anymore because there's not a culture of it. And so then you're stuck having to pay cantors and professionals to come in and they're hard to find also. So I think you have to, to be modest in your initial goals because it takes time to rebuild culture. But that's really what we want is a church where everyone can sing and you don't have to professionalize your music because, because the, the church is more than capable of, of handling it. So that partly began with the selections of simple chant melodies that would be easy for a congregation to learn is that yeah we hearing? started we started very simple with just those weekday i think it's mass 17 correct me if i'm wrong jenny uh, but just the real simple weekday ones that aren't hard to to learn at all and then we started teaching the children some of the harder masses uh, and it's not like we do those every every sunday often i'll, I'll opt for simplicity because i want more uh participation in terms of singing uh but we, we always make sure it's something really dignified and really good and quality of what we are singing. Uh, now, is and, there a, is there a re, are there resources that you, and maybe this is in your, your book, like where do you find these simple chant lines, et cetera? Right, yeah, I don't, I don't get too, too into details in the book, but for us, uh, simply learning the Gregorian chants that, that exist 
uh, in the graduale or the simplex if you need to is a good place to start for the ordinary. Uh, the propers are a lot harder to pick up, but, but obviously people can pick those up with, with a lot of work. Um, the kids chanted propers at the end of our Latin mass for a very difficult mass and they did it fine. Uh, I, I like the Lumen, uh, I think it's the Lumen Christi uh, propers, which is a nice, very simple English setting. And I think that's a good spot to, to really begin if you're starting from, from, a, a, from almost ground zero with a place that has no musical culture. Uh, to speak of. Um, so are there any, any other steps in this process? I mean, was there an education campaign to explain why beauty mattered or was it really just yeah, exposing yeah. people to beauty? So, so part of it is exposing people and letting them see the results. Uh, now there are certain people, uh, to be very honest, if any priests are watching here, there, people will complain and they will leave your church. Uh, but I, you can't let that bother you uh, because what you're doing, you're doing it for God. And if you take the risk, you, you'll be fine. That, that's always been my experience. Um, the, the other thing you said, which I think may be important too, is you don't begin by taking something away. You begin right. by adding a mask. Right. So if there's yeah, I, I, yeah, I tried to do it all very by gently. that awful, you know, go ahead. Yeah, I tried to do it all very gently and, and, and make clear to them. I didn't think they were doing anything wrong. I just thought that we could keep adding and improving together. Uh, and in, in terms of my homilies, I don't, I don't tend to get overly catechetical because like you had said uh, it's not a it's not a lecture we don't want to over intellectualize what's happening at the mass but but i do talk consistently uh, about why we're we're offering god this this sacrifice and we're making it beautiful even while it's, it's a difficult sacrifice and i think that sinks home after a while oh well that's wonderful um is there a, a, a sort of a another takeaway from your own journey about how other priests or you kind of gave us the perspective from the pastor. What if you're just an ordinary parishioner? How would you go about approaching a pastor who obviously if he's hostile, you probably have to find another parish, but he does, he's busy. He doesn't really know Gregorian chant. He doesn't, you know, what, well, well, do you have any thoughts or recommendations for how you approach your father and ask him for more beauty and reverence? Yeah, so I mean, I, I think, you know, priests, because we, we hear a lot of complaints, so it's always nice if people phrase it, even if they're, even if you're tricking us, <laughs> in, in a positive and encouraging way. How can I help you? Do you think that I could get together a group of children and, and see if we can Put together a little scola and we'll, we'll practice and then we'll let you hear it and you tell us what you think that sort of thing so we're, we're all overworked uh you, because i think that's a common problem is that priests have these massive parishes that we we're struggling to know everyone and do our basic duties so if you if you come up to us and tell us hey we want mass to be more beautiful fix it uh we're not going to be responsive because we it's going to annoy us we're you know we're just human beings but also we, we may just not have the time or the knowledge to do it because our seminaries don't really teach us a lot of this stuff. Uh, maybe St. Patrick's does, Jenny, but, but well, uh, a lot of- now. <laughs> does now, a lot of places. So, so it can be intimidating. That's, that's the secret, I think, is that priests sometimes are intimidated by this idea, oh, I have to chant the gospel now. I don't know how to, to sing. I don't know how to chant. I can't chant the preface. I'm, uh, it's not going to go well. It's going to be embarrassing. So uh, I think priests really would benefit just from being encouraged. And as they see, uh, oh, well, they did put together this little children's choir. And it, it is a really beautiful thing. And that the parishioners did love it. Then maybe, you know, he's willing to take that next step with you. Well, that is interesting because it echoes Diana Silva, who was the founding sacred music professor at Ave Maria before they stopped doing sacred music. Um, I don't know what they're doing now, but anyway, the she at her parish, which is a little mountain parish outside of Sacramento, uh, she decided to make the slowest possible ask of her pastor. 
She said, I have a group of people. We'd like to pray, chant Vespers together. Can you give us a room where we could practice praying? Now, that's a really hard thing for a pastor to say no to. Right. You're not, right. Because, you know, you do have rooms, uh, typically speaking, if you're in, uh, so. Uh, and, um, well, some some really good advice. And to be willing not to tell him what he should do, but to be willing to offer what you're willing to do. And I would say that if you'd like to know how to do it, then you really need to talk to Jennifer Donaldson Nowick. And um, Nowitzka. Uh, it's a Polish last name and it doesn't, it's not <laughs> pronounced the way we spell it. So um, forgive me. But uh, so uh, Jenny, Maybe first of all, just some reaction to what Father Michael has had to say. Well, I I didn't at all coordinate with Father Michael, but um, he already made a, a few of my points that I've, I can I, I was bringing my my five ideas, and it sounds like we're we're kind of on the same page. And and um, uh, I I would echo um, the idea of always being encouraging that um, we never do something um, by telling other people that what they're doing is is bad. <laughs> we we do something with excellence and beauty that offers them something new and better to love that will capture their heart and and be more sacred and and that seems to be um father father's gentle approach gentle but clear and um yeah i i think there is a an issue um uh and i I, I mentioned this in a Q&A that we had with the Archbishop actually uh, this past week during our classes at the Catholic Institute of Sacred Music. Um, and that is just the, the issue that Father Michael seems to be uh, dealing with now. And that is that pastors who build up good parishes often get transferred away. And, um, oh, you know, I think there are things to look at in that regard, you know, about how bishops um, you know, follow the recommendation from the USCCB about um, uh, transferring um, priests all the, uh, all the time. You know, there, there are very good reasons why bishops do what they do. And so I'm not second guessing that. But, um, you know, when, when a priest is especially hiring a music director and making these slow and steady changes, if it's not followed up by with a, a like-minded uh, priest who follows a similar path, it can be really jarring for people's faith life. Um, and, you know, just for uh, from the perspective of someone who trains people who work for the church, it's also very jarring to family life and the professional lives of, of musicians to always get jostled about um, whenever there are changes in the um, uh, pastoral leadership of a parish. Um, yeah, so it's, it's a, I think, something um, that uh, is is worth being thoughtful about um, by bishops, the, the continuation of good efforts like this, because clearly it's being done in a gentle uh, um, a way that brings souls along. Um, all right, well, any bishop should be uh, aware of that, but I don't think we have any on this call, uh, on this <laughs> event, so. Jenny, tell me, let's start by talking about the Institute for Catholic Sacred Music, because I have never seen any, I mean, I remember we had originally talked about maybe doing something between the seminary and Benedict XVI, and the seminary said, no, we want Jenny, we want her, we we want Jenny, and, and uh, I was so grateful, but when I looked at, first of all, what you had done at in, in New York at Dunwoody, I'm like, oh my gosh. And I can see how it works. Like here you are, you're helping to form the priests. They move out into parishes where they face some of the problems that Father Michael did. And maybe they're younger and less experienced than Father Michael who came over uh, from as an Anglican priest and had many more years experience at dealing with people. Um, but now, if they want to do something, they have Jenny, their friend Jenny, who can help them and coach them. And, and meanwhile, you're providing the resources by offering chant camps. And uh, I, I was particularly impressed with a course that you offer on how to build a scola because it doesn't, it's not just a class musically in how to build a scola. It's about 
how do you deal with a parish and how do you find the money and how do you, you know, if you, if you have a, a, a so um, it's, uh, and you of course have a particular interest in the Bay Area, but because you can offer things online as well, you have a wide network of students. Um, so, uh, which is also very useful if pastors are looking for recommendations for music directors down the road. So tell me about what you're doing now with the Institute for Catholic Social Thought and what its mission is and what you hope to accomplish. Yeah, so um, I, I'm really grateful to you, Maggie, uh, for your leadership and and uh, and helping everything come together. Um, I, I mean, I wouldn't be here <laughs> if it weren't for you. And so um, we established um, this last fall the Catholic Institute of Sacred Music. And I see some students here on this call um, who I, I spent the last few weeks with um, in our classes. And um, our mission is to um, form people to be servants of the servants of God and to um, give people, um, first and foremost, a spiritual, theological, and historical and intellectual formation in those um, issues, which will enable them to serve the church and Christ's people and draw people to Christ through sacred music. And secondly, to give them the practical skills they need to do that. So um, you mentioned, um, you know, a class that we have called Parish Sacred Music Program Management, um, where the students produce a strategic plan. Um, seven Wednesdays, uh, we met for two hours and 15 minutes, and they produced um, an, uh, amazing strategic plans where they think about um, what does the parish look like now? Where do we want to be? We brainstorm a ton of ideas by bringing in guest speakers and just like talking about things that they might do. And then they'd say, okay, how do I actually get there? Um, and um, and uh, one of our, 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 our most amazing classes that I, I really enjoy teaching is History and Principles of Sacred Music. It's our most academic class. It's um, uh, really intense. <laughs> Those of uh, my students who uh, are in that class know that. Um, but um, when you go through the history of sacred music, you can never come out on the other side at the same person. You have a sense of where we are, how we got there, and what the mind of the church is. And that's that's key, is to, um, we can't just go around like a bull in a china shop um, making changes without knowing what changes we're making um, and why. And firstly, that comes from a formation um, within ourselves. And I, I think, you know, um, what I, I'm hearing both in Nielsen's story and Father Renier's story is that there was a conversion of heart that enabled them uh, in the first place to do anything that they're able to do. And then the realization of the sense, the senses and the, the uh, real world in the role of that conversion in both their lives and other people's lives. And then there's an immersion in, you know, whether it's for Nielsen, the, the, um, the painting or uh, um, iconographic uh, traditions of the church or you know, the poetic tr traditions of the church, uh, architecture, those sorts of things, that you allow those things to really form you and think about their effects on your own spiritual life, your relationship with Christ, and then uh, what fruits does that bear and how then can you go out and help other people experience those same fruits after you're formed? Um, and that, that's really key that, that we form ourselves first. And then we can do, you know, the practical stuff like intro to chant or, um, you know, last week we sang lauds, mass and vespers every day, uh, with an amazing choir of 28 students. We had organ, uh, improvisation students accompanying us. And we had composition students writing, uh, music with, uh, Dr. Frank LaRocca. And, um, we sang some of their music at the last mass. Um, you know, uh, um, there's another student here on this on this call who took um, our ward method class, the teaching Gregorian chant to children. Um, you know, so there are tons of practical sorts of things, but first and foremost, it starts with spiritual conversion and formation of oneself before you ask anything or present anything or offer anything to anyone else. Well, that's that's profound. Now you, uh, did you start teaching at the seminary in the spring? Is that, am, am I right in that? Or did you start last fall? Yeah, so I actually, I had a little bit of a sabbatical in the fall, which was great um, <laughs> because I had to move right. from New York to California and um, moving is not instantaneous. 
<laughs> no, 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 no. So you, but you, you have, you started in the spring and I, I wanted to make sure that was true because I wanted to ask you um, if there is, what are the similarities and the differences uh, between first year seminarians or the seminarians you te taught in New York and their reaction to sacred music and here in the Bay Area, which of course is not just uh, San Francisco seminarians, but from the 10 Western states primarily? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, um, I think maybe it's it's more just a difference uh, of the seminarians and their stories. Um, one of the things I've noticed is that, you know, in um, even in New York, even though people think of it as a very urban area, there's a, the Archdiocese of New York is huge and actually has a lot of suburban and rural areas. And um, those are obviously more conducive to family life. And um, so there you had a lot more seminarians coming from Catholic families and, and Catholic schools and that sort of kind of traditional route towards seminary life. And, um, uh, you know, you had the miraculous conversions, but I would say that here at St. Patrick's, um, the the vocation stories of most guys are, I mean, like you could turn them into movies. I, they're really, uh, it's like God snatching men from the jaws of of Satan and, and uh, converting their hearts and then helping them discover their vocation. And, um, uh, but common to both is, um, the love of um, being Catholic, the love of um, wanting to um, adopt for one's own thoughts, the, the mind of the church. And so with both um, seminaries, I found an openness to um, uh, the church's treasury of sacred music, especially when approached from the standpoint of what um, spiritual fruits does this actually bear in your life? Like why, why should you, maybe you're, maybe you're a, a seminarian, who doesn't really care too much about music. <laughs> I mean, we'll just be honest. We, there are plenty of seminarians who don't really care about music. And what I try to present to them, and I think they have an open heart too, is that even if they're not like a music guy, um, they are impoverishing themselves as a pastor of souls if they don't enrich their pastoral toolbox with drawing people to Christ through sacred music. And one of the points I always make is, um, and maybe Father Michael will be able to add to this list, but what are what are the some of the things that people complain about it at their parish? It's, you know, the homilies, the parking, the um, the fellowship, uh, the temperature and the music. <laughs> I'd say those are like the top top things uh, people complain about. And so even if a guy isn't a music guy, he has to care about it because it's going to profoundly affect the hour a week where his parishioners come to mass. And if he's only relying on his personality or his preaching or a, a, the perfect temperature on the thermostat to keep people in the pews, you know, he's he's not handing on um, the faith with the energy and vigor that a full approach of um, the church's sacred music can hand on the faith, can tr really transform people's lives. I want to invite the audience to ask questions via the chat box. And Jenny, so we all know the sad stories of how how many Catholics who go to mass weekly or say they do, who don't believe in the real presence, including some who don't believe in the real presence and think that's what the church teaches, which is about as big a catechetical failure as you can imagine. But let's not worry too much about all the things that go wrong because they always do. We want to go on a, if we're an ordinary Catholic parish and we want to people to not only know about, to but to experience the real presence of Christ in the mass. What's the first thing that pops into your head that you would recommend? One of your seminarians is out there now. He's got the ear of the pastor. What should we, what should we do? Well, I uh, I would say the first thing actually is is something that Father Michael already mentioned, which is to encourage your priest to sing the mass. And how do you do that if you're just a lay person? Um, I would say go on a little bit of an adventure yourself. Find a Roman missal and figure out how to sing the music yourself. Because going through that process, even though you're not the priest and you're not going to be singing it, you'll have a sympathy for the priest learning those sorts of things if he never learned how to do that in seminary. And I 
I would say, uh, you know, Father Michael had brought up um, that seminaries largely weren't really teaching that um, previously, but I would say that's that's by and large not the case anymore. I, I'm happy to report that seminaries um, by and large have really uh, great music directors and, and formation now. Um, but you uh, can understand, okay, well, this is, you know, how I learn how to sing a preface. Oh, and there are texts that I have to sing and there's no music. How do I learn how to do that? Those sorts of things. And you got to get a little bit of sympathy with the priest. And as Father Michael said, you know, no priest wants to look like a fool in front of his congregation. And he also doesn't want to make the experience of mass um, uh, burdensome. So if he feels like he can't really sing, he's just not going to do it. So um, learning the basics of how to use your voice, the physiology of it uh, are, are really good. You know, encourage your priest to do it. Um, maybe, you know, uh, find someone who's a very patient person who knows how to sing the mass or who knows something about the basics of singing and see if there's a way that your priest would have a little bit of time in his schedule um, to be able to access those things. But um, even singing on one note, as I always tell my students, is always an option. <laughs> and the fact of singing on one note um, makes it clear that what we're doing is, uh, yes, um, is, is immediately recognizable as sacred because we don't go around singing on, on, on one note <laughs> or several notes throughout life unless we live in a Broadway musical. And um, so the singing of, of, of the mass shows that the dialogue that we have is in the face of God. It's not just you and me, but it's all the choirs of angels, it's all the saints, and uh, we, we are together, gathered together in the presence of God. And also the priest singing that that mass has a profound effect on people's expectation of what prayer sounds like. Um, and it, the, the chants of the Roman Missal sound like prayer. <laughs> they are simple. They are uh, prof uh, profound. They're easy to react to, especially the priest parts and the people's responses. And um, they also make a statement on um, any other music that would appear at mass, that if you put some piece of uh, music next to the priest chanting the preface and it sounds weird, it's probably because the other piece of music doesn't fit the mass and shouldn't be used at mass. So it makes a real um, a statement about um, what music at mass should be. And, and just simply changing people's expectations is, is really helpful and helping them get into a new gear um, in how they they pray at mass. Um, yeah, so if I, oh, what's that? I, I, and a, a second related sort of thing is um, that uh, I would encourage people to discover the proper of the mass. You know, there is a great love that people have for the lectionary um, as Catholics, right? That we go to mass and we make our way through the Bible in a systematic way. And it's not just the scriptures that the priest chooses for us to hear on uh, on a Sunday or a given liturgy, but instead something that the church assigns us. And that in fact exists also for the things that the choir sings and it's called the Graduale Romanum. <laughs> and um, so the church assigns, uh, you know, a text and a melody to be sung at the beginning of mass, at, at, um, in between the readings, at the Alleluia, at the Offertory, at the Communion. Um, and one of the spiritual fruits of orienting ourselves towards the church's choice of text and music, even if it's in a, an English adaptation of the chant, is that it's not about me. It's not about my choice. I have to come to God and say, Lord, teach me how to pray. I'm not just gonna tell you what I wanna tell you. I want you to put on my lips the words you want me to recite. I want you to put on my vocal folds, the melodies the hand, that are handed down through us to tradition. And it's an act of self oblation, which is the fundamental disposition of the mass that we offer ourselves to God the Father in the union with the, the sacrifice of Christ through the Holy Spirit. And I found that um, when we make that self oblation in something small, like denying ourselves our own musical choice in favor of the church's musical choice, it bears fruit in other areas. You know, like if we struggle with something with the church's uh, doctrinal teachings or moral teachings, and we're, we have this small kernel experience on Sundays of orienting ourselves in that act of self oblation and forgetting myself and choosing God's way instead of my own way, that that spills out 
into those other areas of life too. That's a huge spiritual fruit of this. It's not just something as, as Father Michael said, um, it's not just about having a particular taste or getting my way at the liturgy. It's, it's really about um, uh, orienting ourselves towards God through the teaching capacity of, of the church in her guardianship of the liturgy. Well, those are some very profound ideas. We promised people five ways. So do you have a couple more? I do. <laughs> okay, let's keep going. Well, those are number one and two, encourage your pre priestessing the mass. Number two, learn the proper of the mass. Three, teach your children to sing. And this can be done at home. You know, I every family should learn how to sing the seasonal Marian antiphons and the Ave Maria. Sing the Angelus. Just take the, the, the prayers of the Angelus, even sing them on one note, and then sing the Ave Maria three times. It's a great way to learn uh, a chant. you repeating it three times <laughs> at noon, perhaps. Um, and um, uh, one of the things that we, we do at the Catholic Institute of Sacred Music is we teach people um, the ward method, which was um, a, a music education method that was ubiquitous in Catholic schools throughout the 40s, 50s, and 60s. But it was founded by Mrs. Justine Ward, who was a cat convert to Catholicism. And she was profoundly influenced by Pope Pius X's Moda Proprio on Sacred Music, Trolley Solici Tunity, where he said that um, the active participation of the people is to be restored through the singing of Gregorian chant. <laughs> and she had the reaction of most people, which is, well, the kids don't know Gregorian chant. We don't know, or uh, people don't know Gregorian chant. So how do we teach them if that's what the Pope is telling us to do to participate in the liturgy? Well, we teach. We teach starting with the children. And so things like chant camps are a great idea. But Mrs. Ward made a beautiful, beautiful teaching method that really um, makes uh, children into comprehensive musicians. And, um, and it's always centered on that notion of giving children a voice to um, offer themselves at in their own role, in their own place in the sacred liturgy. And I loved what Father Michael said earlier about it's not just the singing for some. And that was Mrs. Ward's idea behind the first book of the, the Ward Method. She actually called it That All May Sing. <laughs> she has tricks in there for, you know, how do you get kids to be able to access their singing voice that it's not just for the kids who can automatically do it right away how do you encourage them you know so many kids um you know were told when they were in uh fourth grade preparing for the christmas program oh you know like you're not really getting this part this song so just mouth the words <laughs> <laughs> so we can get through the program and then they never sing again, which is terrible. <laughs> so you should never do that to kids. You should always be very sensitive to um, their development and know that it is normative uh, for a person to be able to sing, you know, barring some sort of real physical deformity or injury or something, that it really is a normal thing that people can learn. It's not a magic trick. Um, a fourth way that I would say is to memorize prayers that you can re you can pray when receiving the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. and many of these prayers, like the Anima Christi, or I really love you know Saint Ignatius's prayer, um, the Sushi Pay. Take Lord and receive all my liberty, my memory, my understanding, and my entire will and all that I have and possess. Um, there are many beautiful settings of the Anima Christi. Um, we actually, uh, for our wedding, my husband and I commissioned um, a dear friend of ours, a composer, Nicholas Lemmy, to make a musical setting of the St. Ignatius Prayer, the Sushi Pay. So he would be able to give you a copy of that. You could buy it on his website, which I think is nicholaslemme.com, L-E-M-M-E. -E. Yeah, Lemmy is L-E-M-M-E, -E, Nicholas, like St. Nicholas, a really fine composer. We've worked with him at Benedict 16 as well. I didn't know that though. That's really yeah. interesting. We're going to have to all go and find the YouTube and, and listen to that. I I really loved, you know, having those, those memorized prayers though. And I think this is important in a, in a um, age of catechesis um, responding to an ail, age of failed catechesis where people said that memorizing stuff was not a good way to um, teach the faith. And we went too far, I think, towards, um, being in an anti-memorization culture, but memorization is so important because 
we say um, when we memorize something, we have it learned by heart. And that means that it's embedded in itself, uh, in, a, in our bodies in a way, you know, through the physical recitation of it or the mental recitation of it so many times that it can come back at times of real trial, of times of real struggle. Um, and, and those are the things that we're always going to hold on to um, when we... Um, uh, when we're older and there's no better tool for memorization than music. <laughs> so if you want people to learn those prayers, having them sing them, I mean, we all learned um, so little songs when we were kids. Like I can re recite for you all the presidents of the United States because I, I learned a song about it in fourth grade, <laughs> you know, and um, these are music is an important way to impress upon our hearts. Um, you know, we we have bodies and we have souls and music really unites both of those natures of, of the human person. S music is invisible. It's, it's particularly spiritual for that reason. It's, it has a strong connection to the word and the word finds its um, it, uh, origin in the logos. And yet we have to use our breath. We have to use our vocal folds. We have to use our, our the placement in our, our, our singing mechanism. It's a very physical thing. And so um, memorizing those prayers through music is very beautiful. And the fifth way I would say is to um, pray for the renewal of the sacred liturgy. Um, you know, I, I have a very saintly friend um, who uh, has written a, a number of books. He wrote a really wonderful book on, on St. Thomas um, Amor, um, where he has a lot of source documents um, uh, and he's written books on uh, Eucharistic adoration, on medieval liturgy. And I, um, his name is James Monty, by the way, his, all of his books are published by Ignatius Press. Um, but I was really moved one day when um, I was just talking to him about um, something that I was working on. He said, oh, you know, I, I've been praying so much for just the, re the renewal of sacred music and the renewal of the liturgy. And um, then we, you know, went on with the, the conversation and I, I was so moved by that because we can often think that it's up to us, our own work, and um, that we bear the weight of it, but really this is God's work. It's not the assertion of our own way, the assertion of our wills, the assertion of our taste. We are engaging in God's work, thinking with the mind of the church and going out into the deep with surety of the splendor of truth expressed especially through beauty and we can have confidence in that um, but um, our confidence firstly has to be founded on on hope in god to act and move um, and and uh, i think that's a really important thing to remember when we're you know kind of in the in the trenches uh working on these things that it, it's really god's work and not our work thank you jenny so much for that uh, Nielsen, you've been listening. Did anything leap out at you about from your own experience as a creator of sacred art? Yeah, I was going to, I was it? thinking, and I certainly was not going to interrupt because I was learning so much, but so much of what uh, Jennifer said can be applied to the visual art as well. So I, I mean, you know, the, I, I don't mean to get silly here, but I'll just give a little backstory. Uh, you know, when I, when I went off to college, uh, I wanted to, to work for Marvel Comics. I mean, I was born in 1970. I'm a Gen X kid. And growing up, all my male friends, we all collected Marvel comics. That's any boy interested in art. That's what you got into because that was the poor man's art. I could go to a local convenience store and buy exciting stories that were colorful and they had, you know, beautifully drawn figures in them. Um, these days, I mean, the the whole you know, uh, the popularity of, of Disney Marvel movies are people my age taking their children. But then I, so th there's a power for males, especially in those exciting images. But then I go into parishes and they are empty. Um, you know, I know that the, the parish that I belong to, I love it. Obviously there's a beauty around the altar, but the parish itself is very sterile. There's a local parish that has 19th century stained glass. And everywhere you look, there is an image relating to faith. That is a parish that I want to be in. And I assume, and again, I know I'm a visual person, but I have to assume that the average person that is looking around and sees not just stained glass, images on the walls, even in the, the decorative work, the faux finishing, there are images embedded in there, that it, the whole environment 
becomes something exciting and visual. So it's not just the music, but it's a feast for the eye. So uh, the only thing I would add is in this conversation, don't forget the visual as well as the auditory. So I agree. The music, I mean, yes, that is one of the things that's common complaint, you know, that I hear about is, is music in various parishes. But, but I would say don't neglect the visual as well as part of this feast um, to, to draw people into the parish. And even when they're in, into the parish, draw them into communion with their, their fellow parishioners and what is going on at that mass. How do you find, how do your clients find you? How, you work with a number of ordinary parishes. Are they looking for new images of their patron saint or are they new built churches? What See, it's interesting. And again, going back to at some point in the conversation, um, Father Michael, maybe it was something that you said, but most, so I've been doing this since 2007. Most of the parish priests that I work with what they are looking to do is to undo the reforms, the post-Vatican II reforms in their parishes. So they are, I'm 53. So they are somewhere close to me. They're now in a position where they can make these decisions with their own, within their own parishes. And they're looking to basically do to their parish what would have done if some of the post-Vatican II reforms had not in their sense, destroyed their parish. So they're looking to make the parish into an extension of what Vatican II maybe should have, how it should have translated into the look of their parish. So in my experience, that's most of who I'm working with. It seems like, and again, because I'm a Catholic convert, I didn't realize what was going on within parishes in terms of music and visual art, architecture. I had to learn about that after the fact. So it seems like, at least with the priests that I'm working for, there's a big push to move back to what would have been if some of the things had not kind of fallen apart post-Vatican II. So it looks to me, in, in my, from my standpoint, there's a, a flowering that, that is coming into the church visually. So. Well, that's encouraging. Well, I think you're right in terms of if anyone is a... I, I don't think people are really interested in investing a lot of money in, um, what do you say, not non-sacred or modernist. I actually know a pretty fine uh, abstract artist who converted, and I really feel for him because the market for abstract sacred art is pretty minuscule. <laughs> but people people want things that touch their hearts and their imagination and they want uh, fine craftsmanship. So um, what a blessing you are to the church, Nielsen. It's so great to get a chance to know you. Um, is there any questions that we have? I think we're coming up to the end of our time together. I wanna make sure no one has any questions. I did not let's see that for some reason the chat is falling off. I, but no. Well, then, friends, um, thank you for being here. Michael, Father Michael, do you have any final words or thoughts of encouragement? And maybe you could end with a, I forgot, I, I usually begin with a prayer and I just launch right over it. So perhaps you could end with, end us with a, a, a prayer. Um, sorry, Lord. Um, but maybe if you if you have any co final comments too, we'd love to hear from you. Sure, sure. My, I, I mean, my summary is very simple, which is I, I find this whole conversation very encouraging uh, to to be able to to meet uh, and talk with so many people who are really doing wonderful things, um, uh, not just you know for their own benefit because they want to be successful in, in whatever terms the world defines success but because they want to create a beautiful gift to give to our lord and as long as there's people like that you know the catholic church is going to prosper so i'm, I'm very grateful all right all right so i'll close this with how about just a simple blessing Thank can you. i can i use latin is that okay is this a pro latin crowd <laughs> <laughs> you may pray as the spirit tells you to follow. I'll use English. The Lord be with you. <laughs> the spirit. 
May Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit descend upon you and remain with you all. Amen. Thank you. Until we meet again, friends, um, I very much appreciate your being part of this wonderful community and our new friends now, Father Michael, Nelson Carlin, and I'm sure we haven't seen the last of Jenny. Um, just thank you and may the Lord bless you until the next time we meet. Take care. Thank you.